All right. So, Father, we thank you so much for this time. God, thank you for every person who carved out time to be here tonight. I pray that the message would bless them, encourage them. Father, not just for their marriage, but for all the families that they impact and encourage across the globe. Pray, Lord, that there would be one thought that you would put in, uh, in their mind and their spirit to live into that would strengthen their relationships with one another. And so guide my words, fill it with your love. And I pray, God, that everything that you want to have accomplished tonight would be accomplished in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. So tonight we're going to be talking about from ordinary to extraordinary kind of love. I love how St. Augustine, he said, you know, the measure of love is to love without measure. And I, as we were parenting, there were so many different times, not being brought up in a Christian home, I had no idea how to really establish the principles of Christian living in my household. Uh, I didn't have a lot of set rules that ever made any sense. If anything, I would have been one of those kids. It's like, I'm never going to do it like my parents did it. They gave me the uh, opportunity to realize everything I didn't want to do in my parenting. But then there were times that honestly, I would parent either out of guilt or out of fear, or it would be out of emotion um, or anxiety. And so I remember along the, the way somewhere, God gave me this thought. And the thought was, what does love require? And I like that thought because um, what it did is it helped me to anchor why I was doing what I was doing. And so whenever I felt either anxiety or fear, you know, the kids a lot of times would throw something at me that would be, well, so-and-so gets to do this, or I don't understand this. Um, and I'd get in a tizzy like, well, OK, I don't know exactly what I'm supposed to do here. And it would help to anchor me. So why am I bringing that up? Because we're actually talking about the marriage relationship. But what I realized somewhere along the journey is not only with my parenting, could it shift my focus from me and what I needed or what I was processing to the best interest of my kids? The same question worked in my love relationship with Greg. So if I was feeling mad angry, fearful, jealous, if I had something I wanted to, to communicate but didn't know quite how to do it, the way that my brain processes, I could just go and anchor in my heart, what does love require? And sometimes love would require me keeping my mouth shut because I didn't need to say anything. Can I get an amen, right? Um, sometimes love required that I actually spoke up when maybe I didn't want to speak up. And so when we think about loving, uh, I guess what, what the idea is, is, is to be able to turn from what we're needing, what we're processing, what we're focused on, and focusing specifically on our spouse and what they're needing. So I thought, okay, this is send me on a quest early on again, going back to the kids days, what does love require? It's like, okay, well, what is love? Because love doesn't act out of emotion. Love isn't angry. Love isn't jealous. Love isn't proud. It isn't provoked. Of course, I'm talking about 1 Corinthians 13. I started really looking at that love chapter, right? So if you have your Bibles, you can actually look at the that chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We'll be going from there. I'm not going to read the whole exhaustive you know, list of what love is, but we're going to be highlighting a couple of them. Uh, if you have a pen and paper, you can grab that because I'm going to be giving you kind of the definition of it, some practical how-tos of actually living that out, like what does it look like, and then asking a question because any of you that know me, I typically learn by asking questions. I, I introspectively ask the question, and then just much like I would do with a coaching relationship, I coach myself to land on, to remove the emotion from it to be able to get the best optimal outcome from it. And so when we think about what love requires, we have to first know what love is so that we can live it out. All right, so if you got your Bibles, here we go. First Corinthians chapter 13. First off, love is patient. Love is kind. You know, I, I think about it, it's like, just imagine a world where your spouse was gracious and kind 
and loving and considerate and patient with you. And so when you're looking at your spouse, you know, if Greg was here, he'd be Jeremy. He's like, hey, what, you know, I'm sure he'd be giving me guff already. But the idea is, is, you know, it's kind of like when my kids would say, man, I just want some friends, mom. And I, my quick response was, well, if you want a friendship, be a friend. And the same thing is, is if you want love and kindness in your marriage, the same principle applies of be kind, be patient. So I thought, okay, well, if I'm asking myself that question, what does kindness and patience actually look like? I think in today's world is putting that stupid cell phone down, right? It's literally turning it off, looking at your spouse, eyeball to eyeball, and listening to what it is that they're saying. What are they processing? What are they thinking about? Tina, Chris, what are you guys doing up there? I, I just wanted to, oh, eyeball to eyeball. You got it. All right. Yeah. But no, but put down the phone. Look eyeball to eyeball. Listen to what it is that they're processing. Now, I can tell you, and since Greg's not here and he can't interrupt me, sometimes I am going, oh my gosh, dude, would you please just land on what it is that you want to process? Just say it. I'm just like, I'm done. And he gets frustrated with me because I'm a bullet point person a little bit more so. So in this way, we switch the roles because usually the woman's a little bit more wordy. Uh, Greg tends to process outwardly. So he doesn't really know how he feels until he expresses it outwardly. So for me, I have to have the patience and not be going, oh my gosh, and be looking at my watch and looking at my phone or taking notes or doing something else, right? I need to be present. And not frustrated if it takes longer. And thank goodness he does the same for me. He, he'll pause, he'll listen. And I, what I've realized is I probably am a little bit more of an external processor than what I realized. But that's the idea. You know, if you think about practicing patience and kindness, here's your question. So we've talked about the definition. I'm giving you a couple ideas. Kindness can also look like maybe just giving a hug, being slow to anger. Like, what does kindness look like? So here's your question. If we're supposed to demonstrate love, if we're supposed to be a spouse, what are some of the habits that you can do every day to demonstrate kindness? What can you do to demonstrate patience? What does that actually look like? I'd love for you to write those things down. And then here's the actual kind of kicker to it, guys. Choose one way this week, a new habit, an I will or I am going to, an, like, and then be committed to it. Demonstrate kindness by doing this. You know, for some of us who may be hotheads or control freaks, or jealous or insecure or whatever it is like you know when we try to control a situation maybe it's taking a deep breath and tabling a conversation so that it doesn't that that would be a great way to extend kindness to your spouse so for you what is it what is one way right now that the holy spirit would say you know why don't you write a little note of affection you should show and demonstrate a little gentleness or kindness to your spouse. All right. So you could leave a cute little note. Uh, I know for Greg, one of the ways that he uh, used to serve me when I was drinking Sprite, man, he would come home from Sonic with a super size, extra large, one of those little crunchy ice things of Sprite, you know, uh, racetrack used to carry this raspberry tea. And it was just the, the sweetest gesture. He would come home sometimes. He'd have like this Cheshire kind of grin. Uh, and, and it would be so cute because he was so proud of himself, <laughs> but he was demonstrating that he thought of me. And so that's the idea. Demonstrate kindness and patience. What's one way that you'll do that this week? All right, moving right along. Let's move on with definition number two for First Corinthians 13. Uh, it says love does not envy. Love is not boastful. It is not proud. It is not self-seeking. There's the big one, right? I, when, when I look at that whole next passage of scripture, 
in 1 Corinthians 13, the idea is, is once again, not being self-focused, but being spouse-focused. It's, look, oh, look at Nathan's little, hi. <laughs> so cute. But it's, it's focusing on your partner. It's thinking about what it is that they need. I can tell you, man, there was a season of time and, and usually it happens more so when I'm tired or fatigued, when I've, uh, my margin is squeezed out. Usually my animosity will turn to Greg because he's the easiest target and he's the one who's with me 24 uh, seven. But when my margin gets squeezed out, I'll start, I'll catch myself with that stinking thinking of feeling like I'm getting the short end of the stick. It's like, well, I'm always doing that. Or you never do that. You know, those, those kind of thoughts, you guys never struggle with that, I'm sure ever, ever. But for me, for those of us that aren't as far along, that, that tends to show me, oh, okay, that's a practical way that I can catch myself. Love's not proud. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. So in other, other ways, it's not being caught up in envy or pride. It's thinking about what is it that they need? So here's some ideas that I thought, okay, well, what does that actually look like? If we're thinking about turning our focus, that's a lot easier said than done, especially if you have uh, margins that's been squeezed out. So here's a couple ideas to demonstrate, and that is celebrate each other's successes. Man, look for opportunity when, to praise your spouse. If they've done something that is noteworthy of praise, something, what are they proud of? What have they achieved? What have they accomplished? What happened in their day? You know, being able to even ask the question, what are you celebrating, babe? And asking them to tell you what it is. What went well today? We used to do this game, and I think we've shared it with you, the high-low game. You know, you can give two highs or one high and one low, but you can never give two lows. So at the table, we would just share what we were celebrating in our lives. And that's a great opportunity to demonstrate and to celebrate their success. Here's the big one for me. Practice gratitude. You know, when, when I feel like I'm getting the short end of the stick, what I, what I like to do is I like to shift my thinking uh, rather than finding all the ways that Greg's not measuring up or he's not doing this and and that he's never done that and all of those kind of accusations that the enemy wants to try to convince me are really real. I'll flip it and I begin to find what I love, not what's lacking. It's a real great, powerful tool that man, when when I began to look for and seek out all the ways that Greg uh, was demonstrating love to me, I could then thank him for that rather than expecting him to say the words exactly how I think he should have said it or to do the things that I thought he should have done. And he didn't do that. So, you know, getting all collywapas in my mind, I started looking for all the ways that, man, I love that about him. I love that he's a great father. I thank God that my kids don't have to be brought up in the kind of family that I was brought up in. And all of a sudden, when I get that gratitude in my heart, not just trying to wish it or trying to conjure it up or just, oh, yeah, I'm so thankful that he's a good dad. No, I'm grateful that he's a good daddy. Man, God, thank you for that. And what would happen is the shift in my mind. This isn't just for Greg's benefit. It's not just for your spouse's benefit. If you want an extraordinary love, if you begin to practice that gratitude, it changes you from the inside and all of a sudden you're beginning to find all the things that you love instead of all the things that are lacking. And you've got a tool. You've got a weapon against the enemy. You have a way now not to get all sucked down in the mully grubs feeling like you're getting the short end of the stick and all the ways that your spouse isn't this or that. And you begin to start praising from a genuine place. It gives you authority it gives you the words then to genuinely speak life. And like we were talking about, if you want to have friends, you need to be a friend. And if you want a spouse that is lavishing you with love, then by doing that, you're lavishing them with love. And that's going to attract that kind of desire. You will reap 
what you sow. So keep sowing the right things. One of the other things that helped me along the way uh, that really changed my perspective is I stopped avoiding comparisons. Um, you know, it's the it's the locker room talk or the, uh, I don't know, the water. Well, we don't really go to those water bottles because we all carry our own, but but that that kind of talk where it's like, well, so-and-so said that they're they're only having sex three times, maybe a year. And so now we're going to compare our life to that, right? And compare and it's like, well, it, sh it should be enough for you, Greg. Now I'm, I'm bringing in some real uh, life practicality because sometimes what we do is we look at our, our friend's relationship and it's like, well, he does that for her. He should then now all of a sudden Greg's supposed to do that for me. Or she never does that for him. So why should I have to do that for you? That kind of mentality of the comparisons, man, just pause. What is it that your spouse needs? What's going to bring about life? I don't want to be measured by anybody else's standard. So why would I want to try to measure Greg by that or my relationship based off of another? Um, I, I can remember, and this is a real inside uh, kind of experience i remember in my first marriage women would come up to me and say oh i wish my spouse was like your spouse and they were comparing what seemed like on an external i was like oh sweetheart be careful what you wish for <laughs> right that because sometimes we look and we judge an external appearance by another person's relationship that just isn't a reality and so rather focusing in on what makes you guys a dynamic couple? What'll make it even better? So here's your question. What do you love about your spouse? Write down that question. If you got some immediate things, you can put the answers, but Tina, don't look at Chris's answers. <laughs> the idea is, is to write it down. What do you love about your spouse? And and then the idea is begin to find ways to express it to them, either through a note, a mirror message. What are the, their attributes, their qualities, their character that you love about them? Meditate on those things in your heart so as to avoid comparisons. And begin to find opportunity to express it to your spouse so that they can hear it. Man, I love it. Greg is like, uh, my love language is words of affirmation. And Greg is just, it comes natural to him. So uh, like every day, he's lavishing me with some kind of a compliment. And I and there are times where I have to stop. It's like, wait, I, when's the last time that I've given him a compliment? I told him he's the man in a way that it actually stands out that he's the man. And so uh, if it doesn't come natural to you, like you might be a person who receives it real well, but it may not come natural to you to express it. You might think it, but not say the words. Practice saying it. If anything, put it in your calendars. Like, okay, today I'm going to express three things uh, to Donna, Scott, that you love about her. You're going you're gonna to just lavish her with your words of affection and affirmation. Uh, I know Nathan would never do this for Willow, but, you know, Nathan, maybe you could leave a little love note or something and obviously being facetious. All right. You guys get the idea, though, right? Ah, there's the look. I was waiting for you to come on there. The idea is to make sure that as you think it and as you meditate, this might take a little bit more intentionality, but make sure you're expressing it, right? Love is patient. Love is kind. It's not envious. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. All right. The last part that we're going to uh, focus in on tonight, and then I'm going to welcome any other comments or thoughts of things that you found in your relationship that really have helped to take your relationship to the next level, or maybe something that you're struggling with. But the third part of the definition is love always protects, trusts, hopes, perseveres. I love how Timothy Keller shares, love is not just emotion, it's a commitment. And for me, guys, I think the biggest commitment of protecting, because I would never out and out harm Greg, I would never out and out harm anybody, but man, 
the stuff that I could think of on any given day, my thoughts could be killing, right? My thoughts could not be producing life. And what I've learned is that if you think it, eventually it will spill out. Eventually it will flow out into your relationship. If nothing else, through just obstinance or a wedge, a lack of intimacy, a pulling back. And so love always protects. So what are you, what's the mental inventory of your, your thoughts? Are you protecting your spouse in your brain, in your thoughts, in your words? Are you always trusting, hoping, persevering? You know, what I, I love is that 1 Corinthians 13, what it's highlighting is that it's a demonstration that I'm with you, babe. I ain't going anywhere. Uh, those love vows that we took for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, like it's tested in a marriage. There is no relationship that will test your resolve more than your marriage relationship. It will bring out all the junk that's hidden in your heart. And so if we're, if we're to truly take our love from an ordinary kind of love and not settle for that, but have an extraordinary love, then we've got to start with that mental inventory that are we protecting our spouse? In our communication, we always hear like, man, one of the ways that you, you can demonstrate love is to communicate. Well, let me just add a little layer to the communication. In that communication, add the layer of, yeah, be honest with your partner. Talk about your feelings. Talk about your thoughts. But man, for the life of you, can you sandwich it with some life-giving messages? Right? It's not just, well, I feel like, blah, 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 blah. And now I've been honest. There's my communication for you. Woohoo! How's that going for you? Versus really taking inventory of your thoughts, grabbing hold of them and mastering them and speaking life, even if you're hurt. Speaking life, even if you're going through a rough time. I can tell you, here's, here's some examples. Over the years, Greg and I have, man, we have in the last two and a half decades experienced some life. We've had some moments where we were making a million dollars a year to some years that we were qualifying for government assistance, all in a pursuit of following after God. We had some highs and we had some lows. But in the midst of it, God began to really season our words with hope. Messages of hope, not just like we would meditate on those messages and we would remind ourselves. So here's some of the words that we chose to use. Like, I want you to know I'm here for you no matter what. I ain't going nowhere. And that is a powerful message to communicate trust, hope, perseverance. If you want to protect your marriage at all costs, let your spouse know, I ain't going anywhere, babe. I got your back. I'm here for you. We use words like, it's all going to be okay. This is just a season. It's not a sentence. We're not always going to be here. Man, talk about hope. Talk about persevering. Don't kick your spouse when they're down. Or if you're going through a hardship, don't add fuel to the fire. Pause, gain your composure, and truly, again, get your feeding from God. Get your soul saturated with his spirit and then express life to him. You want to go from ordinary to extraordinary. Pepper that language with, man, we're Gormans. You mess with one of us. You mess with all of us, buddy. And in your own soul, carry that same commitment. I like how uh, we would say, I know it's difficult right now, but it's not as real as it feels. We're going to get through this. Feels like it's impossible right now. But what I know is we serve the God of impossibilities. He makes all things possible. Languaging that to your spouse. Maybe you're in a season of hardship. Look at them. Remind them, we got this. God's got us. We're going to get through this time. This is just a season. It's not a sentence. That kind of language is communicating trust, hope, perseverance, a love that never fails. I, many of you have journeyed. Man, I went through like three years of this menopausal state and I was uncharacteristically not myself. The happy-go-lucky girl, the best that I could do is like, Greg, 
I love you, but if you don't leave the room right now, I may kill you. Right? Those kind of feelings. It was intense. And so thankfully, at least I didn't express, but he could tell I was going through a lot. And he didn't say, oh my gosh, woman, would you ever stop having the sweats? I'm tired of going from 70 degrees to 80 degrees in the house in the next five minutes because you're cold and then you're hot and you guys get the picture. The idea is, is that we all have different things that we wrestle with. There are all things that we struggle with. But if you slow down and communicate, like Greg did to me, I ain't going anywhere. I know who you are. There are times where Greg acted like an absolute buffoon. Don't tell him that I said that. Okay. But he did. I mean, he was just like this big bear, just, bleh, you know, all over me. Uh, there were times, as you guys know, throughout our relationship early on, he called me every name in the book. And I would look at him. I'm like, that's not who you are. That's not my man. You don't mean those words. What happened is that it began to be a shield. God gave those things that I didn't take the offense. And I called his true identity into place, just like he helped me. Julie, this season's going to pass. You're going to get through it. It's going to be okay. Do you need a fan? So think about what your spouse needs. Choose to not be offended. Choose to not pick up the, the offense and speak life over them. Prioritize your relationship. Make time for them. There is nothing more important for you to do. We tell our coaches all the time, look, we want them to do as many reboots as possible. We want them to be uh, very actively engaging and helping other couples, but you can ask any one of them. And we always say, keep the main thing, the main thing. You keep this right first and you keep this right with your spouse and then pour out to others. Don't try to give what you ain't got. So the idea is to make sure that you're prioritizing your relationship. When your kids have 15 activities that they want to be involved in, you might need to tell them no because it's causing a wedge or a division or a, a lack of ability for you to be able to have conversation with your spouse. So prioritize that relationship and let them know that you are committed to protecting it and to preserving connection. All right, so here's your question. And then we're going to take some Q&A, any best practices that you all have. But what is one way that you need to better protect your spouse? Maybe against an unruly relative. Is there a way to let your spouse know that they're a priority without having to sever the relationship? And are you willing to sever that relationship if it means that you're going to lose your spouse, right? Is there a distance that you need to maybe place? Uh, is there a way that you need to protect your spouse from your own thoughts? And if so, how are you going to have that mental game to not go there, right? Where you see the best, believe the best, speak the best to them. What is one way that you can demonstrate they are the priority. I had one client one time say, I don't have time for my spouse. I'm like, what? Yeah, I don't have time for my spouse. I got my job. I got my kids. I've got my dog. I've got, and, and she went through this tirade and she thought that I would understand. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Look, I get it. You're busy. But if you have to get rid of the dog and if your kids have to not be in 15 sports, then we need to make some changes. And we need to make them quick because you've got your priorities all messed up. Uh, I, I love that one of the things that Greg and I had a lot of growing up to do, we had a lot of things that we didn't do well, but there was never a doubt in our mind. Well, maybe the first seven years, but after the first seven years, there was never a doubt in our mind that one another was the priority. And if that meant that I said no to Rick Ward's church out in California when they wanted me to go out there, you know what? Gladly. And if that meant that he didn't take a job promotion that would disrupt the family unit because he knew, gladly. Are you following me? It's how do you, if love is not self-seeking, there's no self in there, guys. And it doesn't mean that we're a doormat. It doesn't mean that we just blanketly live our life and we have no needs. But what it does mean is that we saturate our spirit with God 
and we ask, what does love require? And sometimes, like we started out, that means that we're going to have to start out and maybe we need to keep our mouth shut. Sometimes it means that we need to express some things that we haven't been expressing, like love, acceptance, forgiveness, value to our spouse. And maybe it's pepper in our language with hope. What does love require? And when you think about your relationship, if you were to the last question is, if you want to take your love from ordinary to extraordinary, extraordinary, what one thing can you do? Not what one thing can your spouse do? What one thing can you do to move forward to make sure that that love happens? All right, I'm going to open up the phone lines. Any thoughts, questions, comments? While we're doing that, oh, yay, got a couple already. Uh, good. I'm going to go to them. Steph, Grant, you guys had your hand up first. Please, what thoughts, questions, comments do you have? Well, we um, actually were, we just did a, our podcast on something similar to, or well, what made me think of this with you. Uh, you know, if you want to flies in your marriage, take a crap. If you want. <laughs> If, if you want butterflies, plant flowers. Woo. And so it's up to us to create the environment for love if you want love. Wow. Yeah, that's just, we've been talking about that a lot. Um, and it's just a little different perspective instead of thinking about, you know, kind of what you were saying, like, well, if you would change and do this, it's like, well, what? If I want a different mate, a different spouse, then what do I need to be that's going to attract and open his eyes to want to be something different? And then I also, I love that you're reading Corinthians 13, which we attribute to the love chapter, but then it always makes me think of Galatians chapter six, where it expresses the divine expressions of love. So love is the fruit of the spirit, but then you can also take that and the expressions of that are kindness and self-control so if love is kind it's because god's love is so full in me that that is an expression that comes out so that's what i have to control right i am the only one responsible for the level of god's love inside of me so as that grows it's automatically going to begin to express as kindness towards and that just starts to create that environment of love so that's just kind of what we've been talking about so it's really cool that you brought this up tonight Man, guys, I love that. You know, I, Scott Fay, a dear friend of ours, talked about that's, that. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly my, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we actually yeah. mentioned him a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah kind of exactly. like that guy. He's, he is a great yeah. guy, just lives down the road, was the uh, vice president of the John Maxwell team, great friend of ours. And, and that's exactly it, guys. He, he would talk about if you want butterflies, you know, you can run out and try to catch them with a net and stuff, yeah. but we're just going to flutter away. But if you create an environment for yeah. him. Yeah. What you They're pursue all. eludes you, what you create, you will attract. Yeah. yeah. So I like that. Wise, don't don't crap in your marriage. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what you get from tonight's call, well, don't crap in your marriage. There you go. All right. <laughs> well, good stuff. I really love that. Love that. So the idea is, is how can you foster that kind of environment? And you do have a lot more control over that and that's the deal there's only one person you have control over yep okay and if you really think about it you're not very good at controlling them you know so at least that's where i am so if i only have control over me and i'm not even good at controlling me then it's up to me to grow and then if i grow i'll start to create the right environment to attract her that's so good. You know, and what what I love about that, and you guys are alluding to this, um, if you haven't already kind of said it, it's I, I remember there were times where I would do the right thing, do the right thing, do the right thing, but I wasn't actually being changed. What I was just doing as I was being disciplined. And then right. it was like, well, it didn't work, you know? And then I was right, mad. Right. But the truth was, is I hadn't really changed on the inside. When I changed on the inside, and took accountability and did my works as unto God. It's like that that place right. where Greg and I had, had this knockout drag out fight and God told me to love him like he had loved me. And I realized that was without any conditions. And I made a heart commitment. 
where the right. intellect and the heart aligned. It wasn't just discipline. It's like, no, I'm going to do my work, whether Greg deserves it or not, God does. Right. And then I began to get that infill that you were talking about, Steph, right, where I was being changed. And Grant, how you said, I could only change myself. But the truth was, is only God could change me. And right. it wasn't, mm -hmm. I was so saturated and fulfilled in him that those actions, I wasn't keeping track anymore. Right. of what Greg was right. going to do his part or not. And as I did that, I released what all those expectations did my act of love as unto God. And then all of a sudden I started notice, noticing the love gestures Greg was making. So mm -hmm. I could to give and receive love. And if he didn't do it exactly like I thought he was, it's okay because I wasn't expecting him to. Yeah. And so I would release that and it, man, it changed everything that was good yeah, that's, stuff. that's really one of the reasons I, I i love the word transform more than i do change yeah because a change you can change 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 and then you can go right back to what you were you just yep. change for the moment but you know the bible says be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind and so it's up to if i will transform i only have to do it once because you're forever changed wow good stuff. yeah so Anyway, Woo. I'll let someone else talk. Good stuff, guys. Thank you for chiming right. in. All right, Tina, Chris, you guys are up. And then the hey. Appersons. Yes. Um, so I, I actually have a few things, but I first wanted to say one of the very first things you said, I really love that about if, if it's what you want, be the kind of spouse that you would like to have. And I really, really love that. And um, get, we say that all the time, mm -hmm. but I want to use that more because that is so true. Mm -hmm. um, another thing is we're in the middle of a, a the study, two or better than one um, that you guys wrote. And I love it because like Greg said, it's kind of the 30,000 foot view of a reboot Yes, uh, because yeah. it's helping you to understand, you know, like um, in, in, in order to love your spouse and, and understand yourself so that your spouse can understand you things like core values and things you know understanding like what are your core values so a lot of a lot of the things that we learned in our life plan or our, our reboot was our core values and I didn't realize I actually put it back to every argument or every issue that we had and so we can identify now like like I can tell now if he upsets me I'm like oh wait a minute, that was that core value. So, and then he even can, can be like, oh, I, I can see I violated this core value or that core value. As we, as we communicate more about these things, we have a deeper understanding of one another. And mm -hmm. so when the wheels, when the, in, in Greg's terms, when the wheels start to go off the road and get a little sideways, we, it doesn't take much for us both to realize it. And wh whoever's offended to realize, you know, that the, 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 the offense was not intentional and for the I, offender to realize how they offended their spouse. And it's like, okay, both of us, we recognize it right away. And we're both on the offensive in correcting it. But the bottom line is this is a lot of work. It's like figuring out, like figuring out yourself to figure out your spouse. So your spouse can figure out you. And I, and we always tell our couples, you know, you, when it's an everyday thing, you literally wake up, you brush your teeth, you get dressed and you work on your marriage. It's, it's a literally uh, an, an intentional um, act that you have to do every day in mm -hmm. order to thrive in your marriage. So yep. just wanted to add that. Did you have anything? Uh, just to, just to stack onto that, I'm reading a book right now about uh, military folks and uniform personnel tra uh, transitioning out and back into the civilian sector. And I'm reading in this book and like every other chapter, I'm going up to Tina and it's like, Tina, did you know this about me? I didn't know this about me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so as I, as I discover some of my own motivations uh, and I share them with her, it's like, oh, well, that explains a lot. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's just a, it's just a big thing. Um, one of the things I, I also want to say was uh, I love the part you were talking about the, uh, person that was saying they had all these obligations you know the dog and the kids and the job and the, and I have no time for my spouse well we can communicate in words all day long and and we should and we can and we 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 could 
but we also communicate a lot with our actions without using a single word. Wow. And yeah. when you take, you know, when you when you get rid of the dog, when and I'm not picking on dogs, we love dogs. <laughs> we do. Uh, but when you get, you know, you get rid of the dog, you take the kids out of without even saying a single word that communicates to your spouse, hey, I want transformation, as as Grant said, I want transformation. Um, and that's the first indicator of actually taking taking that step. And uh, the other thing is, you know, we can talk a good talk all day long. Um, but all of these things taken, as you guys say all the time, takes intentionality. Right. So we have to clear some space on our calendar to be intentional about it. Right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and so, again, going back to that, when you when you clear some space on the calendar, um, that's that's the first sign to your spouse that, hey, you know, they're taking the first step. They're serious about this. We really want transformation and not just change. Yeah. Love what you guys said about the core values, you know, and I think the shift, it was interesting because a, a thought came through my mind when you said that you, you talked about core values and that uh, the question of being able to understand, oh, I violated that. Mm -hmm. And there's such a difference when you, you go, uh, you, you can have the posture, of, why did you do that? <laughs> or you can have the posture of, huh, I wonder why you did that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The difference of uh, it's one is filled with accusation. Mm. One is filled with discovery. It's kind of like the difference. I, I could never understand when, um, oh gosh, now I forget his name, but he, he was the father of John the Baptist. He had doubt in his heart and he gave a question. How can this, how could this be? It was filled with doubt and almost like an accusation. And the, the same thing that Mary did almost verbatim, same question, but it was, how will this be? And the difference was one was filled with doubt and accusation, and one was filled with discovery. Like, tell me more about that. Yes. I don't understand Why? how this will be. And the same kind of intent can be played out in our marriage relationship. We can have accusation, or we can look at them and realize again, this is why we guys all the time you hear say it, see the best, believe the best speak the best you in our at heart of heart when we believe the best about our spouse then what we're able to do is we're able to ask questions from discovery like help me understand why you're doing this because this is not who you are right like, what's going on with you why are you snapping greg's always talking about me slamming cabinets by the way for the record i don't slam cabinets i might <laughs> smack bags trash bags but never slam cabinets <laughs> the point is is we can discover it's like what's going on Right. In the world. Why are you acting the way that you're acting? There's a difference there versus what you always want. Mm -hmm. Right. So I love that, guys. Great stuff. And what, I do one, two better than one series, by the way. Exactly why we designed it. So yes. thanks for affirming that it's doing that. Yes. yes. One one is rooted in division and the other is rooted in intimacy. So mm -hmm. just, you know, which one do you want? Yep. Love it. Good job. Thanks for chiming in. Good stuff. All right, Appersons, you're up. Grant, that was, uh, I love that uh, perspective of change compared to transformation. That was good. Yeah. Um, your pastors came like, a couple of weeks, ago, weeks ago, Julie and Todd, uh -huh. yeah, and they spoke on honor. And that really motivated us to take some time to look at one another and honor each other and try to operate in that perspective as opposed to, mm -hmm. you know, contention. And not that we were very contentious before, but it's just another layer of growing. And so anyway, that was our part yeah. of our takeaway. Just not just each other, but just even Anna. So they said, mm -hmm. I honor meant, and they used the basis of Mark six, um, where a prophet isn't welcomed in their own town in Ooh. his own town. And, uh, how honor is means you highly esteem someone and where we can dishonor the divine by like not honoring them by treating them as common and how often do we do that in our family I know like at the end of the day I am on stage at work but when I come home I might like let out on my family all the stress and so we that's just dishonoring to them and so we've really just been um I've been meditating that on a lot on how we can improve in that area yeah 
Wow, guys, I love it. Do you have like, because this is really rich and I don't want to put you on the spot, but can you think of ways where, like, is there a practical way that you've treated as common? And mm -hmm. on the opposite end of it, as you're meditating on that, what does it look like to switch that uh, from treating as common to treating with value, to treating with honor? Is there a practical way? Not to put you on the spot, it's okay if you haven't thought that far through. Yeah, but... well, I, I think I have something because Donna just recently went back to work. And so that's put a couple of days a week that she's not at home during the week. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. So I always tell her I'm a good house husband, but when she comes home, I, I look at her needs and, and I meet them because she was at work, even though I'm working at home and doing some things here. So that's one way is I, I see what her needs are and yep. I just fulfill them. I don't really ask her, Hey, can I do this for you? I'm like, Oh, you're hungry. Well, what can I make for you? You know? Mm -hmm. So that was, that's one practical way that I've done it. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I love it. Did you have anything with your kiddo that stood out? Like, because I, I know that you, you referred to it. Is there a way? Yeah, I mean, we've been just trying to um, pause a little bit more and listen to her a little bit more. And like, uh, like today, she like texted me and she's like real frustrated. She's changing jobs, but she only has a couple of weeks left. And at this particular job, she just, they've just cut her hours. And so I knew she was being sarcastic and she was like, um, I'm only working 27 hours this week. She usually works like 40. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like God's like, kind of like what um, Grant and Stephanie were saying. And God's like, show her a different perspective. Because my first perspective was, oh, yay, you only have to work 27 there instead of 40 because she always comes home frustrated. But I knew she was being sarcastic. And I was like, so I was like, yay, you know, and, and she was like, well, mom, that's not what I meant. And I said, I know. But anyway, I was just trying to be like joyful about it and teach her about seeing the positive side to it because she is like negative Nelly, yeah. you know? And so anyway. I love it. And I, I try as she's doing all the, the negative talk is to not judge her on that, but honor her for who I know she can be. Mm -hmm. and, you and speak into that as opposed to correcting her complaint and just speaking to we who we know she can and is mm -hmm. can be and is yeah I think it's um it's actually good practice to learn your coaching skills on your child <laughs> so your adult child it's like you ask I'm starting to like ask her more questions instead of telling her what to do yeah. and so I think she's kind of responding to that a lot yeah. more I love it I love it you know one of the things I think if we want to take our love from ordinary to extraordinary and live to discover your spouse. Mm -hmm. Just live to discover them. I, there are still things I'm finding out about myself, let alone Greg, right? To be able, it's, it's a lifetime. It's a journey of really understanding and experiencing your spouse to wrap back the layers of why they do what they do, who they are as a person. I, I want to live in such a way that I create the environment that we were talking about that brings out Greg's absolute best. And so the idea is when we can really have that heart change, you're going to foster the environment for the things that you actually desire in your marriage relationship. So with that, uh, I want to close this out in prayer, but I do have a quick announcement. Anybody else have any other comments though, before we go questions, thoughts, all right. Well, one way then uh, this week, I, I want to bring us back to those questions. There are a few questions that we wrote down. I encourage you to, to meditate on them. You know, it's one thing to be on this call and to hear something, but now it's living it out to make the life change in our marriage relationships, in our parenting relationships, in our own heart, in our own mind to really be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So make sure you go back to that and meditate on it through this week. Also, ladies, if you haven't gotten signed up yet and you haven't heard about it, you better be checking your spam filters uh, because we've been sending messages about the whole month of May. We are providing two free, uh, two free courses. One is what I wish my mother had told me about men. 
And it's all dealing with the faulty paradigms that we sometimes carry into our relationships that sabotage them. Uh, that's one of them. The other is discover, develop, and do your God-given purpose. Again, all of these videos are maybe three to five minutes in length, short, sweet, but uh, very powerful to help you discover, develop, and do your God-given purpose, or to maybe get free of some of those paradigms that are sabotaging your relationship. So those two courses are absolutely free. And then in addition to it, all of our coaches are coming together and they're giving uh, a three minute or less word of encouragement each day. Um, I'm popping in every two to three days, giving a word of encouragement, but the rest of the month is pe peppered with all of our coaches. Uh, so if you haven't gotten signed up for that yet, please reach out to me at Greg and Julie at marriedforapurpose.com. And we'll make sure that you guys uh, have the link to be able to get all of that content absolutely free, no strings attached. It's just in honor of Mother's Day and women uh, all throughout the month of May. We wanted to be able to provide that free of charge to help you walk out your significance and to truly understand uh, your design. You know, that God created you on purpose for a purpose. So make sure you reach out to us for that. Other than that, I'm going to close this out in prayer. Thanks for joining tonight. Thank you for jumping in, everybody, for your comments. Good stuff tonight. So, Father, thank you. I pray that each couple would take one thought that they could implement that would bring about more of your presence of love, acceptance, and forgiveness in their marriage relationship. I pray you lavish them with your love, lavish them with your presence, that your presence, your peace would be uh, their place where they live, where they reside, not a place they visit, but a place that they reside. I ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. All right, guys, thanks for joining.